Welcome back for more MP Biology. Today we're going to talk about speciation or the formation of new species. So we're going to look at what mechanisms cause an increase in new species. This is something that the College Board is going to test you on, guaranteed, some book reading. So one of the th big misinterpretations that exist in the world of speciation is shown in this picture. And you could figure out that there'd be misrepresentation based upon where I stole it from, but that's perfectly fine. Um, yeah, there's all sorts of issues with this picture. Among them is it shows how we're turning one iguana into a bird and thus indicating that, oh yes, it turns out to be this type of directional shift, which turns out not to be true. It actually isn't a one species gets transformed into another. It actually is a bit more complicated, yet far more logical than how you think it turns out to be. So this requires us to deal with what a species is. A species is a group of organisms living in the same location at the same time that can reproduce, and their offspring are also capable of reproducing. There's lots of issues with that definition. It's the one that I'm going to use. I mean, there are other definitions of species, so that is not by all means the best definition because you'll find that with bacteria, yeah, that really doesn't apply. And with a lot of plants, that really doesn't apply. So it's not a particularly good definition, but it'll suit our purposes. So if I'm trying to make new species, one of the big keys that show up with that definition outside of same population, same location, same time, is they need to be able to reproduce and their offspring need to reproduce. The big requirement of speciation has to do with reproduction. We need to have some type of method of preventing reproduction. As long as we can prevent reproduction, the result is I can isolate populations. And if I can isolate, I can cause speciation. So how can we stop these mechanisms? Turns out there's two ways that you can really stop reproduction is you either don't allow fertilization in the first place, or we need to stop fertilization from coming to fruition. If we prevent fertilization from happening in the first place, we call that a prezygotic barrier. And that could be you're found in different locations, or you end up mating at different times of the year, or you have different preferences, what we call behavioral differences, or we could have mechanical isolation, meaning sperm and egg don't recognize each other. So literally, the parts don't work together. We could also have what we call postzygotic barriers, which would be Okay, so reproduction happened, fertilization happened, but it, we're not going to get anything viable. So we could have what we can call gametic isolation. Well, gametic isolation actually falls under the prezygotic, so it's also the parts don't match each other. But we could have reduced hybrid viability, meaning we end up having this hybrid, but it doesn't really turn out that great for it meaning it's not going to really survive that well. We could have reduced hybrid fertility, meaning it's sterile. You make a sterile output. Or we could have a hybrid breakdown, which is literally it starts to die on you. It actually falls apart, and it's just not a good keep. The hybrid viability and the hybrid breakdown, the major difference is the timing. So reduced hybrid viability is you're going to die early on. Hybrid breakdown, you die later on. So how do we get speciation to occur? Turns out we need to have a few things. Step one, we need to reproductively isolate. Once we reproductively isolate, what we're going to end up forming are two, or is at least one smaller population. We might have two small populations, but we're going to get at least one small population. If you have a small population, we get genetic drift. Genetic drift will shift the genetics randomly, because that's genetic drift, until the two are of size where genetic drift doesn't matter and it's more about natural selection. The result of that is natural selection will now take these two populations that are somehow separated that now have different sets of genetics, thank you natural or genetic drift, and now it can drive in two different directions. And the result of that will be if given enough pressure two distinct populations where if you try and let them reproduce, you're either going to have prezygotic barriers, postzygotic barriers, or nothing happens at all. You have brand new species. 
allopatric speciation happens all over the place. The easiest of these examples is when the seas were higher, the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean, or at least the Caribbean, were the same area. So Panama didn't exist. And as the seas dropped, the result was we got Panama, and it separated the Caribbean from the Pacific. That separation separated out these two types of pork fish, and the result was we got two different species. And the result is because they happen to live in the same area, but they're separated by Panama. They got a physical separation. When we have speciation due to a physical separation, we call that allopatric speciation. Other famous example of this are what we call the cichlid fish. I know that says chiclid, but it's pronounced cichlid. These are found in Africa and South America, and they're itty bitty tiny fish, and they live in pools all over the place. And what we notice is those pools dry up, and we get smaller populations of them, or you had floods that last forever, and then water would recede slowly, and we start to isolate the pools. And the result is we would get allopatric speciation because the pools are being isolated physically from each other. There are other versions, so either we physically separate or we're going to have some other choice, which is going to be either a timing or we're going to have some type of genetic barrier or we're going to have some type of behavioral barrier. And those we call sympatric speciation events. They are organisms right next to each other, but due to a preference of time or what they like when they mate or a genetic difference, a genetic oops, we had a mistake during meiosis, the result is we get two different species that are right next to each other. So, so when I look at this plant here, it's referred to as an anemone plant. They turn out to be the exact same organism, for the most part living in the same area, but ultimately what we noticed if we look back in genetic time, evolutionary time, is one on the right had an accidental doubling of the chromosomes. It became a polyploid organism. And the result is it had a genetic difference from the anemone flower on the left, and that resulted in a divide. The two plants lived next to each other, but because they happen to have a genetic difference, that was enough to cause a prezygotic barrier, and the result was ultimately speciation. We made the two populations smaller. We had genetic drift, result of genetic drift till we had is populations grow, but we didn't know what was going on until we had two distinct gene pools. Natural selection drove them separate. We've seen the exact same thing. This actually was figured out in the year 2009 using these finches from the Galapagos Islands, famous set of studies by the Grants, Peter and Rosemary Grant, who studied Darwin's finches. What they noticed was the the finch in the middle called the cactus finch and the one on the right which is called a ground finch they knew what they were and they turned out to be in separate locations well they have different preferences but due to a drought we noticed that we got a weird mixing that occurred we had a difference in behavior and what that resulted in is the finch that popped up out of nowhere on the left that we call the immigrant finch. So we actually watched this happen in real time where a new species was coming about due to in part geographic isolation but also a forced change of behavior. We've also seen this with this type of plant. It's called goat's beard. I can never remember what the T stands for so I wrote it down. It's called tragospogon. It's a type of plant that we find in the Midwest. And it turned out to have, within real time of us watching it, a sim sympatric speciation event where it actually changed its genetics. And the result was we got two different species, the ones, well, all the ones that you happen to see all over the place. We've been witnessing the potential rise of a new species when it comes to the sea slugs that you happen to see listed there because they all happen to absorb chloroplasts and and algae from things that they eat. So we're watching the potential formation of photosynthetic animals. So far, they're not photosynthetic on their own, but it seems to be increasing the likelihood that we're going to probably end up watching this event within a lifetime or two, depending on the selective pressure. 
We can also see this with the bird on the far left. The one on the right is a ground finch. We don't care about that one. So the one on the far left is called a European black cap. And we're watching it speciate through allopatric yet also sympatric speciation because of a change in where they choose to fly during the winter. During the summer times, these black caps are always in Germany. But during the winter time, they just split up where they would normally travel to. Some of them go to Britain, some of them go to Spain. And the result is they're reproducing differently in different locations based upon preference. And it's driving this one species of the common European black cap into different species. And we're watching this happen as we speak. So how quickly does speciation happen? Good question. Depending on how you talk to, you'll get a different answer. Some cases it seems to happen slowly over time. In other cases, we don't see much change. Then immediate change occurs. So the slow gradual switch or the slow gradual branching we call gradualism. The one that seems to happen really fast we call punctuated equilibrium. Which is correct? Well, odds are the answer is both. We have some events that have rapid speciation and some events that have not so rapid speciation. It probably depends on the environment, how large the populations are, so how bad was genetic drift, if it happened at all, and then selective pressures placed upon the two populations. The point is we know how to get new species because we have watched it happen time and time and time again. We can now explain the biodiversity of Earth.